Guru. So this, this is a work, it's a meditation on, on deep time, on, on history. Uh, and while it appears future focused, as Leo will unpack later, we very much draw upon the geological time scale in the work. And I think one of the most meaningful things about this is the, the multidisciplinary collaboration, which I'll unpack shortly, and the range of disciplines that came together to, to realise this work. So uh, my colleague at UNSW, Dr. Ainsley Murray, uh, was the key behind getting us in the, uh, the Venice Biennale. And uh, she had a series of individual works in the show. Uh, myself, I had an individual work, which was, which was image-based, image and sound-based. And then the work we're gonna talk about today uh, was, was a sound-based work. So for people that don't know about, oh, sorry, can, can people hear me okay? I can hear, um, oh, great, thank you. So for people outside of architecture, uh, the Venice Biennale is the most prestigious international exhibition within the architecture discipline. So a big deal for us. Uh, the, part, the version we were part of took place at three venues. This is the Palazzo that, that our work was at, Palazzo Bembo. And um, here's a shot of the room. So what I wanted to emphasize was that the work that we're focusing on today centers on sound but the overall composition of, of image, text and sound within the experience of being in the room uh, was very carefully composed through the interdisciplinary collaboration uh, with my colleague and with the four of us who worked on the project. So this is just a bit of a contextual shot. The soundscape that, that we did was playing through the speakers in this room and there were two different other works that were exploring text. And so how we thematically composed those works was, was in dialogue throughout the process. So this is my colleague Ainsley's work called Registry of Itinerant Architectures, which uh, involves a website as well as uh, physical sound and image components in the space. My individual work, as I mentioned, was image and sound based, but through headphones. Um, there's a shot. Uh, well, a shot is on a large screen. Uh, and then uh, the team that put this work together, um, here we are, uh, quite varied. Um, Elise will talk shortly. Uh, her background is in acting and theatre and English literature. Uh, mine is in uh, sustainability architecture and landscape architecture. Um, Leo, the sound guru, and um, Josephine, the award-winning uh, English lit author. And then the collaboration, as I mentioned, with Ainsley, who's, who's a visual artist and uh, an architect. And then we drew upon a greater range of disciplines um, in, in the work that, that we interpreted and, and channeled. Now, over to Elise. Thank you so much, Josh. And I'm, thank you for your patience as we sort of move the screen around everyone. And I appreciate that this is a little bit of a different sort of project in terms of the focus of today's symposium. Um, we were very cognizant of the fact that you have a historical focus and looking at this beautiful work and unpacking that in different ways. Um, obviously, we're looking at history in terms of geological history. And we're looking at sound in terms of a soundscape. And we're looking at image in terms of two different ways of thinking about image. The first is the image um, of the composition position of the whole room as Josh was just discussing. The second is the mental image. So I'd like to think about that and um, we're going to look at the psychophysiological effect um, of interdisciplinary artistic projects and that's really the pocket of the methodology that we're focusing on um, today. So this particular um, project was looking at the Anthropocene and it was based on a work by Professor Farrier, who's in the University of Edinburgh, and it invites us to reconfigure our relations with time, space, and existence in the Anthropocene. So in this particular geological era in which we find ourselves, where humans have become the dominant driving force of the planet. We're asking, what does it mean to live enfolded by deep time? And this is really our sort of historical context. So it's a mixture of the historical and the now and the future. We're looking at time as quite a stretchy, elastic phenomenon. 
So given that poesis as a term is to make or transform or bring forth, how can we as literature scholars, as literary scholars, as practitioners, as artists, as designers, as sound designers, how can we reimagine our geologic future? And how can we harness attention and affect in audiences, in readers, for an enhanced sensory experience of what we're thinking about in terms of the sublime Anthropocene? Don't, just jumping back to the methodology, we're sitting probably in the pocket of post-humanism here. So looking at material interchanges across human bodies, animal bodies, and the wider material world, to quote um, Stacey Alamo there. So in the Anthropocene, thinking about the visual elements of it, the image that comes to mind, hybrid and novel landscapes um, are what we're looking at. So the Anthropocene is a patchwork of um, landscapes that have been intruded upon by human impacts. Science in terms of the sublime is often presented in a, in a terrifying factual manner, particularly when we're thinking about things like biodiversity loss or climate change. So this soundscape, which Leo is gonna talk through because he did all the amazing work on it that I can't take any credit for whatsoever. Um, he completely composed it and, and created it. Um, the soundscape is an experiential approach used to help um, assimilate or come to terms with terrifying realizations of history and the now. So what we are thinking about in this research and what we'd love your feedback on is this concept of emotion as a multi-sensory medium conditioning our responses to events or sensory fields. So I think this is probably relevant to, I hope, all of the presentations today when we're thinking about images, um, artistic works, for instance, but also literary works. So in terms of uh, the neuroscience behind this, we're looking at precognitive or pre-reflective triggers that trigger our brain's neuronal pleasure circuit. So what is really giving audiences and readers pleasure? How can we as scholars and practitioners enhance that to get across our messages? Specifically, we're looking at nature connectedness in this project and based on biophilic design, um, organic forms and ratios as well as place-based emotional responses to stimulate empathy and motivate pro-environmental responses. So this particular project has a bit of an activist intent. So I won't go into this in too much detail because I'd like to hand over to Leo because um, he's gonna talk about the sound, which I think will be of most interest to you all today. Um, but the effective impact of indirect exposure to natural environments um, is looked at in terms of stress reduction theory already and attention restoration theory. Now, why is this relevant? Basically, it means you don't need to be in a living environment to have an effective impact. This research shows, um, and if anyone wants the, you know, the studies, we can send it through if you're interested or you probably come across this yourself as well. Um, the research indicates that indirect responses to representations of environments also triggers these responses. So this means sound that is recorded. This means images that is displayed digitally or through artworks. Um, when we are in, in when we incorporate, or sorry, when we encounter as audiences or readers an environment represented or not that is biodiverse, that is richly stimulating, that has different uh, transitions, that's engaging, it triggers our open attention rather than um, directed attention. So directed attention when we're focusing on a task marking student papers comes to mind, um, we get cognitive fatigue. When we're looking at something like an artwork or listening to a poem or reading a really evocative novel, our brains go into open attention. So obviously a very simplified explanation. Um, and I hope any neuroscientists in the room aren't too offended by that. Here's some of the studies that we're drawing on here. Uh, sorry, I just got to show you that very quickly because I don't want to take up too much more time on this. But just to give you an idea of what this research is grounded in. And these are some of the um, effects that are, um, have been recorded from looking at sensory richness in texts, in images. So we're seeing a decrease of blood pressure, cortisol, support for the parasympathetic nervous system, reduction of fatigue, decrease in depression and restoration of attention. Essentially, this can be boiled down to one term, fascination. 
And fascination being driven by extremes of scale, textures, motion, dynamics, irregularity, all of these patterns that were present in our ancestral environment as the Homo sapiens species evolved. Sorry, I'm going so quickly. So in this particular project, we're thinking, how can we harness this through interdisciplinary means? How can we work as a collaborative team to harness text, image, and ge uh, geological history um, to represent fissuring of geological timescales, ruptures? How can we express the sublime artistically? How can we move audiences? And what impacts may that have for conveying messages in the Anthropocene? The text that we're drawing on is from, as I mentioned, Professor David Barrier's book, Anthropocene Poetics. And what we've done is myself and Josephine have created um, a, a new narrative based on that, which I narrated um, over Leo's fantastic sound. So this particular work is also interdisciplinary. So we've got <laughs> interdisciplinary works nested within interdisciplinary works. And we presented this also as a spatial poem. So this was our image component of this particular project. And Josh designed this really beautifully in the shape of the Fibonacci sequence. And he's got the rupture through the middle representing human impacts upon the planet. And these little words here, he's designed from Farrier's texts in this poem. I'll just zoom in a little bit more so you can see. Concepts like imagine temporal horizons, thickened time, granular. So we're looking at different scales, different textures. Geological, terrifying geological intimacy, the uncertainties of multi-species ecological crisis. So without any further ado, thank you so much again for um, your patience and your interest and uh, hearing Josh and, and I speak. And it's my great pleasure to hand over to Leo. So I'll just stop sharing my screen as Leo comes to the stage now. Um, if we just talk a little bit about the specific of my part of the project, I think Elise and Josh have given a good overview of the whole thing there. Um, it was kind of the third wall of a of a installation, if you like. Um, it was originally going to be a standalone piece, but because it appeared to fit quite well with the other two pieces, it was decided it would actually play back for the whole room, and so the three pieces might actually work together. The themes were time, space, existence. So as a sound person, I hesitate to use the word sound artist. I'm more of a sound designer, typically, uh, and art and design are quite opposite ends of the uh, spectrum there. Um, so how to represent what we were doing, so which sonic elements to use. Originally, I had intended it to be a binaural listening experience, which would be headphone-based and allows a a kind of sense of immersion, if you like. But once we actually agreed that we were going to do it as a thing for the room, that completely changed how I was going to have to do it. So it's kind of an intersection of time, space, and a focus on ecology and the kind of interconnectedness with the Anthropocene there. Um, sound design here is much more aesthetic than functional. Usually, if I'm working on film, TV, interactive things, it's a functional and kind of emotional thing combined. Here, it's much more of an aesthetic design. Um, and so right from the start, I had some you know, questions for myself or problems to solve. How do you depict time sonically? You know, other than a ticking clock, which is not very good on a geological scale. Um, and so some natural sounds, some design sounds, um, some sounds that are identifiable, some sounds that are not. Um, I was really interested in the idea of listening as practice. Um, and there are a few aspects of sound. We're talking about interdisciplinarity here or transdisciplinarity. Um, sound itself is fairly transdisciplinary. I myself am fairly transdisciplinary. As a prior to kind of academia, I was a recording engineer and a broadcast engineer, and I did criminology as an undergraduate degree and, and something else. I mean, individuals themselves work across disciplines and so it's a nice idea to work with other people across several disciplines um this project whilst it works with the other ones that are australian based but different parts of australia uh and everyone is probably well aware of the specifics of their 
locale. So the birds and insects and frogs that are in Canberra are very different from the ones that I'm familiar with in Perth. And everyone who travels will recognize those differences. So some sounds are very recognizable and unique. And then I'm just mentioning about um, acoustic ecology, which is again, another kind of obviously incorporates sound, but acoustic ecology really started in about the seventies and much more focused about um, preservation or field recordings sound walks, getting people to focus on that attention. And we'll just see where acoustic ecology has moved to. It was pioneered by Harmory Schaefer in um, Canada. And it was started off with a very interesting underpinning philosophy, which was that we try and hear the acoustic environment as a musical composition and further that we have responsibility for its composition. So that really is less about academia, more about activism, really kind of born in the 70s. Uh, and John Stern, also a soundscape is a total contact, um, concept. Um, for example, um, bees, frogs and, bird, frogs and birds um, are quite recognisable sounds in the soundscape that we created um, and become a little bit of a key signature sound of that place. I'm not sure how much attention you pay to frogs in your neighbourhood, but they would probably be quite different to frogs in someone else's neighborhood. Birds tend to get all the attention. They hog the limelight a little bit. Um, whereas frogs and insects are really important as well. Certainly scientifically, um, the, the UN Environment Program of the 100 crop varieties that provide 9% of the world's food, 71 are pollinated by bees. So bees take quite a, an important role in ecology in the natural world. And so bees take quite a prominent place in this piece as well. Um, just to end, um, I might, um, going back to what I mentioned about art and design, quite often my work in sound design is typically hiding my work. As a sound editor, if people notice your work, you've probably not done your sound editing very well. Whereas this piece, it's much more about being very explicit about the message that you're communicating. Um, using sound as a means of reflecting on that relationship with the environment. So on the one hand, I wanted to make some things very affective. Um, on the other, I wanted people very definitely to recognize the sounds that we're talking about. But all the, at the same time, this is kind of the interconnecting glue for the narrative that Elise and Josephine had written. So I might just um, play a couple of the sounds and we'll do a bit of a guessing game perhaps um, about what it might be. So the first sound that starts the piece is this one. And realize it's a very difficult guessing game because I know what it is, but people may not. And it won't literally be a guessing game. Um, whilst I'm no composer, um, and I would never call myself a composer, I'm someone that uses music typically, but the music, and we'll call it music, um, that would be typical of the type of music that's in here. Any apologies to any composer in the room, realize we might have a couple. You would be hard pressed to put that onto a score because it would probably be one single note stretched over several bars. Um, if we have a look at the second one. Funny enough, sneezes and coughs I could have included in my um, piece, but I didn't because I thought an audience might well add them by themselves. That you might think is wind. It sounds like wind, but it's actually um, a musical instrument playing wind. I didn't choose to use wind because it's something that's easy to recreate. And everyone's heard wind before, although when you think about it, wind is not the actual sound of air, it's the actual sound of air hitting something. Because for sound to happen, there has to be an event. Something actually must have happened or be happening for there to be sound. It's completely unlike vision. A table is still there and will still be a table as long as there's light. But it will be silent because there's no event happening. And so the differences between sound and image 
are quite profound quite a lot of the time. There are also some natural sounds in here as well. Turn that one up now. Yeah. And it's very quiet. Oh, it's a little bit too quiet, potentially. Um, but that one is um, a recording that I'd done a few years ago now, but um, a very particular location in Western Australia. Some native birds and some native frogs. There is a very good um, library of Western Australian frog sounds in the WA Museum that are particular to Western Australia and can't be heard anywhere else. Some of them are bizarre sounding. Some of them sound like ukuleles. Some of them sound like motorbikes. Some of them sound like birds. Um, frogs are a fantastically wonderful oral fingerprint of an area. You can recognize them. Indigenous people, certainly currently and definitely of the past, would be able to recognize the area they're in from the birds, from the insects, from the frogs that they were hearing, which are particular to that particular locale. Some of the sounds that were in there were my own composition. Some of them were my own field recordings. Some of them were other people's field recordings. And some of them were a bit more like this. might be hard to picture what that actually is. That's a sonification of data of the Earth's magnetic field um, combined with uh, lightning on Saturn um, from probes, NASA probes, I believe, that were sent out there. And on a similar, similar notion, um, some of the sounds here. So that's the Earth magnetic field was a um a european space agency sound how do you represent something that you can't see um and sonification has become quite an important thing um just to round us off that one might well sound like birds again that one is actually um the sound of van allen probes in the radiation belt of planets the reason i chose that is because it sounds very much like bird song and some of the Van Allen probes recordings that are done from the 1970s and 1980s do genuinely sound like birdsong. And looking at data and to make a connection with it, and to make it meaningful, how do you make something meaningful in this project? Obviously, we've got a, a desire to have to bring about some affective change with people. We were talking yesterday, it's like, this is a little bit of the Arthur Dent. There are, there are bigger problems. How do you communicate really, really big problems to people who, um, say, are not yet influenced by scientific data? Um, we need some other way of doing it. So the Choix de Chanson interdisciplinary approach, we took a very similar approach that was starting from a different place. It was using multidisciplinary things but starting with a problem of how to communicate, this is a very, very big problem. And how do you see a connection with something that people can get to grips with? Um, to open up those imaginative horizons, partly because to a scientist, the focus is on the human impact of climate change. If you're talking to an anthropologist or someone from humanities or social sciences, it's not humans, it's particular humans. It's particular groups, it's particular cultures, particular political systems. And that's what should be explored a little bit more. Um, and this project, a little bit like Armory Schaefer originally, what's the balance between academia and advocacy there? You can't just stand by and just be an academic describing the death of a planet. Um, surely there needs to be some advocacy. In terms of the sonic component, um, that auditory display, sonification of data, which some people were a bit uneasy with initially. Um, but text on screen is 
uh, a visual version of the same thing. The language started orally and was then then became a visual medium later. So it's audifying data. Um, in my work, certainly moving away from the natural inclination towards secrecy or hiding work and making this very explicit. The more about this project that people can see, see what they're hearing, and maybe using the approach of Schweinish Johnson, or sometimes it's described as an interactive documentary, where people can hear, click, find links. I, I never knew bird song sounded like that. Um, I never knew those frogs sounded like that. Um, and getting more and more information. So if it's a way in to get people to connect with some of the some of the issues that we're talking about, that would be a great thing. Um, there are some other um, people in Australia doing similar things. There's a really good one called Salmon Tales, which use, again, multiple voices, recordings of journalists, environmental data, using people reading out corporate reports, um, combined with field recordings and some sound design to examine salmon fishing in Tasmania. It doesn't sound like the most fascinating topic to use as a documentary, but with those multiple inputs, it becomes a fascinating thing using these different inputs. Um, there are some additional references there um, and some of the other recordings that I used uh, and some of the other um, references are just there. <laughs>